Hello and welcome to tonight at 8 from the RSGB. Now, as much as we like, like to think that our rigs and antenna are the most important part of our station, they don't count for much unless we have the right conditions. And so tonight we're going to find out how to use the latest propagation prediction tools to use the best bands at the best times. And who better to help us than, with this than the chair of the Propagation Standards Committee, Steve Nichols, G0KYA. Welcome to Tonight at 8, Steve. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Would you, can you just give us a quick rundown of what you'll be covering tonight? Yeah, well, first of all, we're going to have a quick look at the state of um, the sun and uh, where we are in the sunspot cycle and what's been happening uh, over the last month or so. Um, and then we're going to look at some of the tools that are now available. Um, there's been a switch away from PC-based um, programs and apps to online apps. So we're going to look at some of the uh, tools that are available for that and some of the um, recent innovations that the Propagation Studies Committee has come up with. Um, so hopefully by the end of the, uh, the program, people have a greater idea of what's actually available out there, all three, of course, and how to use it. Excellent. Well, we're looking forward to it. And before Steve's presentation, a reminder that if you're watching this on Monday, the 1st of March, then this is live and you can ask questions and add comments on either BATC or YouTube at any time during the presentation or straight afterwards. Please include your first name and call sign if you have one within the message. Also, please note that you can make this video stream fill your screen on most devices, usually by double clicking on the picture or pressing the full screen button. But now it's time to go back to Steve and find out how we can get the best from the latest propagation tools. Excellent, good. Right, well, let's get started straight away then. And the first thing I want to do is talk about where we are in sunspot cycle 25 or solar cycle uh, 25. And if you look at this graph here, you'll see that we're right at the bottom there. In fact, if you, we should be climbing out of the sunspot minimum. Um, and in fact, we did have a little bit of um, an upswing in December and people getting very excited, but it's just been very, very flat ever since. Um, but we are, um, as I said, climbing up um, the, 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 the steep part of Sunspot Cycle 25. And normally, I say normally, um, what happens is that we climb out of that very, very quickly. So I think over the next couple of months, we should see a big, big swing um, up um, towards actually getting some sunspots so we might get some uh, propagation if we're lucky but um, if we have a quick look at the uh, sunspot cycles over the last 400 years you can see that there was a Maunder minimum in kind of 1650 to 1700 there's a Dalton minimum uh, around about 1800 we had a big maximum in the mid 50s and everyone's been saying well are we are we heading for a sunspot minimum again well no we're not really I mean there are been um, lots and lots of reports um, in, in terms of you know what's the sec next cycle going to be like. And the consensus is we're not dipping into another morning minimum, despite uh, some people's doom and gloom. Um, I think that this cycle 25 will be similar to cycle 24. That is not outstanding, but certainly not a morning minimum. Um, we had the minimum in December 2019, I think, and. You know, it's going to be slower, lower luminosity, lower activity at maximum, uh, consistent with the downward trend we've seen, but certainly not um, a Maunder minimum. Um, there have been one or two reports recently that uh, Cycle 25 could be a record breaker. Now, I don't quite know where these people get these ideas from. Well, the scientists get them where they want. But I think the consensus is over about 60 different um, opinions is that um, it's going to be similar to 24 but not fantastic. Anyway, I thought we'd just, just talk about that um, before we move on anyway. And this is what the sun looks like at the moment on the left. And in six years time, that's what we'd like to see. Lots of sunspot activity. But of course, with sunspot activity, you get coronal, um, or sorry, you get solar flare activity as well. So it's not gonna be a smooth ride. For every sunspot you're gonna get, you have the potential for a solar flare and a coronal mass ejection which can, you know, deplete the ionosphere and, and make things worse. So be careful what you wish for, that's all I'd say. Now, the other thing I just want to talk about is the solar wind. The solar wind or the fast solar wind from coronal holes um, has been a, a dominant disruptor of HF communications over the, uh, over the last uh, couple of months or so, well, actually over the last year or so now. Um, 
And the thing is that the solar wind is on the whole um, a disruptor of HF propagation. It can reduce maximum usable frequencies, can cause some pre-auroral enhancements. But on the whole, it's, it's, it's a bad thing. Um, in fact, we, we spotted this today. I don't know if you noticed that the K index went up to, I think it was six, I, went, I think it went up to, which was due to a fast solar wind coming from a coronal hole on the sun's surface. Um, luckily, it's recovered quite quickly, but I would imagine that um, you know, it, it, it could take a, a day or so for the uh, ionosphere to, uh, to totally get back to normal. Um, if you're interested, um, you can see the um, sun um, in ultraviolet or near ultraviolet, or sorry, extreme ultraviolet, okay, right in a minute, or uh, near to X-ray almost, um, at solarham.com. Uh, one of the um, uh, SDO, Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, images is taken in extreme ultraviolet. And it's this one I've indicated here on the, uh, the, uh, the map uh, or the diagram. And it shows these dark areas, which are coronal holes on the sun's surface. Now, a coronal hole is an area with um, an open magnetic field line. They're, they're less energetic. Um, open magnetic field lines, which means that the solar plasma, if you like, can, can flow out from the sun. And uh, that's what gives us these uh, fast solar winds that we've uh, been seeing recently. And how fast is it? Well, somewhere between about 350 and 550 kilometers per second. I always have a job to get my head around this. 500 kilometers a second, that's like from here to the other end of Cornwall in a second. That's fast and lots of uh, matter as well. I mean, it's essentially plasma when it leaves the sun um, and it, it can cause disruption. This is an image that um, was taken earlier and you can see this um, coronal hole marked as number 28. That was what caused the um, K index to, to, to rise this morning. And you'll see we've got this other one um, marked as 30 now coming around the sun. It's on the solar equator, so it's going to be facing us in about another day or so's time. And then about two days after that, I would expect that the, uh, the K index will go up again. So, you know, I'm sorry, it's going to be pretty disrupted uh, time this week in terms of uh, solar activity, I think. Um, so just to see how long does it take for this solar wind to, to hit the Earth from a coronal hole? Well, if we take the distance from the uh, Earth from the sun to be 149.6 million kilometers and the speed of a, a coronal mass ejection or the solar wind in this case from a coronal hole 400 to 800 kilometers per second, it takes about 2.1 to 4.3 days um, for this material to hit the Earth. Um, this is why it's a little bit tricky um, trying to do uh, predictions because we know that if, if the um, the coronal hole is, is absolutely spot on facing the Earth. It's going to be 2.1 or somewhere between 2.1 and 4.3 days later that this stuff's going to impact the Earth. But whether it's two or four, we don't really know until it actually hits us. Um, and so that's the problem with it. We don't know how fast um, this solar uh, wind is going to be until we first, it first gets picked up on one of the satellites or the spacecraft out there. And then we get a good feeling for it. Also, it depends on the, what we call the um, direction of the BZ. Um, now, because it's plasma, it has a frozen in magnetic field. It actually has a magnetic field as it comes off the sun, and that's frozen in, so it's set at that point. Now, if that solar um, wind has a BZ that's negative or south paint pointing, it couples more easily to the Earth's magnetic field, and that's when you get these, um, these big... Um, K index rises that we've seen today. Um, if the BZ is pointing north, it doesn't couple so easily with the Earth's magnetic field and it is, has um, far less effect. So what we're looking for really is coronal holes, solar wind. Um, we need to know the speed and we need to know uh, whether it's BZ is pointing north or south. And if you have it like it was today, with a strongly pointing um, he said it's pointing south, that more easily couples and we get disruption. Now, that will push the K index up. Now, which, which one do we want to actually look at? Well, you'll see that there's um, a number of K indices um, that are listed. Um, as you see on this chart here, we've got uh, Boulder, Colorado, Fredericksburg in, in Virginia, 
uh, college in Alaska, I think it is. But basically, we average them out and we come up with a planetary K index, a, a planetary uh, K index or KP index, K for uh, K index, P for planetary. And that's the one we usually norm uh, normally talk about. That's the one we use. So if you're looking for um, the K index, look for the one marked KP for planetary index. OK, well, let's get on to what I really wanted to talk about tonight, which is what software is available for uh, propagation predictions. Now, traditionally, um, all the software that's been available has been PC based software with apps that you run on your computer. Uh, very, very few out for the Mac, uh, but mostly PC window based software. And these are still available and um, work very well. But we've moved from that to online software. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But just to, to give you a quick recap, these are the most common ones. This is VoaProp by the late Julian uh, G4ILO, uh, which is still a great little program. Um, runs on a PC and um, will give you area uh, coverage maps, uh, show you the likelihood of, of being able to work somewhere or what, what part of the world you want to work. Um, and also on which band. So, as I said, Veroprop, if you search for that, it's still available. Um, not been developed for, for some time now, but it still works and it still works very, very well. Uh, W6EL Prop was another great uh, program. Getting a little bit long in the tooth now. I did hear rumors that um, there was talk of getting it rewritten now. I think Sheldon Shallon, who wrote it, is probably, uh, uh, I think he's retired now, so I don't think he's very interested. But I, I did have a conversation with somebody about a possible rewrite of W6EL prop. Still a good program if you can get it to run on a Windows machine. Um, but I think there, there are better ways of doing it now anyway. HandCap by uh, Alex V 3 nea another uh, great program. It works with uh, BoaCap, uh, the Voice of America Cap program, um, and gives you charts like this. Again, you can um, select the band you want, the time you want, and it will automatically come, oh, what antennas you've got as well, and it will come up with charts like this. And in fact, I use this for my um, monthly charts um, that I have on g0kya.blogspot.com. The final slide, by the way, will have a list of all the URLs um, that you might need for some of these things. Um, but it's a great little program. Um, doesn't take much uh, of a machine to run it. And a bit like uh, VoaProp gives very similar results because they both work with VoaCap. VoaCap was the software that was um, designed and built for the Voice of America um, to um, do ionospheric propagation predictions. Um, and the final one was ASHF, which I don't think is, is available nowadays. Uh, but it, it was a paid for piece of software. It was about $99. It's very good. But again, it's been superseded um, by one of the newer online um, tools that we're going to look at. Now, just before we get on to that, I just want to talk about um, Ionosons, Digisons, and uh, what they tell us. Now, we talk about things called the critical frequency. And this is a, a, a tool, the Ionoson is a tool. This one is based at the Rutherford Apson Laboratory down in Berkshire. This tells us that, well, it basically sends a radio wave straight up um, into the ionosphere and it see what, sees what comes back. This tells us what we call a critical frequency. That is the frequency when sent directly up that is returned back to the Earth. And it also tells us the height of the ionosphere um, and tells a lot of the useful tools like this. So from this chart here on the Chilton Ionoson, and you can find this if you Google Chilton Ionoson, you can register and you can get these graphs if you want. But you can see there that um, the, I don't know if I can move the, uh, yes, I can, there we go. Um, you can see the height of the ion or the F2 layer there at 250 kilometers. And then you'll see this figure here where it just disappears and that's where it goes straight up and out uh, into space. And that's happening just below seven megahertz. So in fact, we say that the critical frequency of the F2 layer there is 6.8 megahertz. Um, and from that, we can extrapolate and um, then work out what the best frequencies would be over longer distances. But it's a, it's a great tool. The Arnold Sound's a great tool. But these are a little bit difficult to read. Um, I'll freely admit that. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do on the PSC was, was there a way of actually making this information more easily available and more digestible? 
And the answer was, yes, there was. And Jim Bacon um, came up with ProcQuest, um, which is free to use. Uh, you don't even have to register for it. You can just go and use it. And this takes the information from that Chilton Ionosond and plots these figures. So you can see that it, this is a, um, a time of day across the bottom. And then we've got frequency on the left. And so you can see that uh, this is the uh, critical frequency coming up here. And typically it rises after dawn, as you would expect, peaks around about midday and then goes off again after sunset. Uh, in this case, I can't actually see the figures, but the crit critical frequency there is somewhere around about um, five megahertz or so. But then what Jim did is he um, makes the program extrapolate that. So to try and give you an estimated, and it is an estimate only, um, maximum usable frequency over different distances. So this one here is the 3000 kilometer MUF. And you can see it comes up, rises um, with sunrise and takes a little bit of a, a, a jiggity roll, depending on what the ionosphere is doing. Peaks around about midday and there it's just about, uh, where was it, 26 megahertz. And then goes down again at night. This is a useful tool because this will tell you all sorts of things. It will tell you um, what conditions are like on 80 meters. How, you know, how close can you work on 80 meters? If the critical frequency drops below 3.5 megahertz, this means that anything signal sent up at 3.5 megahertz is going to keep on going. So we can use this to work out how conditions are going to be on 80 meters. Um, and because we now extrapolate as well, we can work out the best frequency to use um, over different path lengths. So in this case, you can see after sunset, the MUF drops off completely. Um, 20 meters is going to be no good for 3,000 kilometers, but 10 megs probably is. So this is a useful tool. But the good thing about this is that Jim has thought about it really carefully, and he's added some um, bits and pieces to it. You can select the Chilton Ionosond with this, or you can check the, um, the, the box up here and check for the, the Fairford, the RF Fairford Ionosond, or the Daub Ionosond in Belgium. So you have a, a choice of three, and sometimes you'll find that one of the Ionosonds is offline for whatever reason. Um, so if that happens, you can select another one. You can also go to the archive and select any date that you want um, and check what the, the graphs look like at that point. But you can use it for all sorts of things. You can see um, if you've had um, a solar flare, for instance, that has knocked out the ionosphere for a time. You'll see that as a, a gap in the, the data. Um, and you can, as I said, you can also check it out to see what's happened with sporadic E. Um, we've got some FOES there. That's the critical frequency of the, of the E's layer, sporadic E layer. Well, come May, June, July, you'll probably find that you'll see some sporadic E up here, more like um, 10, 15 megahertz. So it's a useful tool all round. Um, and I think that that's one of the first tools that uh, came about. And it's always been also being developed all the time. So as I said, we know you now get to choose three digits on. So you can you can check Fairford, Daub, or you can check Chilton. And um, as I said, we we used to use it and I have used it for things like Club Championship, which is currently on tonight actually, um, to see what we think um, conditions are going to be like. And I noticed just before I came on, I checked and that said the critical frequency for 80 meters was about 3.5 megs which probably means that people are going to be struggling to work locals uh, once they're outside of the ground wave range anyway, um, but probably be able to work Scotland. So this, this tells you instantly what is going on with 80 meters. You, you know, you don't even see, they need to turn the radio on, you can see what's going on. So it's a useful tool all around. And that's, so that's propquest.co.uk. And, and a recent addition has been this, which is a graph of FOF2, so it's the critical frequency of the F2 layer, critical frequency of the ES or sporadic E layer, and also the critical frequency of the extraordinary wave uh, layer as well. Um, I don't know if you know, but the, any radio wave that goes through the ionosphere gets split into what we call the ordinary and the extraordinary wave. Um, and what you find is the extraordinary wave has uh, an, an amount, maybe half of the energy that's in the original wave, but you'll find the critical frequency of that is about half a megahertz higher. So you can see on this chart here that um, we've got the critical frequency here, FOF2 is at 3.5 megs, but you also see that you've got this 
higher uh, extraordinary wave, which is a little bit higher in frequency. And so this probably means that what you find is that signals may still appear on 80 meters, um, but they may be weaker. And that may be why that you're only really using the um, extraordinary wave um, critical frequency, not the uh, ordinary wave critical frequency. And Jim has been working on this and it's going to have um, uh, new uh, charting facilities to show you the height of the, um, the ES layer, the sporadic E layer as well. Uh, he showed me um, some graphs of that he's working on. So this is something that's ongoing, it's developing. And um, when it comes to sporadic E, um, Jim does a, a blog, a daily blog, um, from around about 1st of May onwards. So I'll tell you what he thinks will be uh, good in terms of sporadic E, um, what will be bad, and also whereabouts you can work. Now, a recent addition to this um, has been this, which is the, what he calls the EPI, or sporadic E uh, probability index. So now um, you can call up a chart, and it will show you where you are, where you're trying to work, and if you find that you've got um, a really, so this color, deep color, <coughs> excuse me, red, um, under this ring here, this uh, 700 kilometer ring, there's a good chance that you could work maybe uh, into Warsaw. So if that was red there, you'd be able to work into Warsaw via sporadic E at that particular time. And this is a, a brand new facility that's uh, coming in this year. It's, it's there already, but we haven't had um, the sporadic E season that you get from May to September. Um, so it'll be a really, really good tool if you want to work um, 28 megs, 10 meter uh, sporadic E around Europe. Uh, and it's also working on longer paths like transatlantic paths as well. Um, but sporadic E is, is a useful um, mode of propagation, not only on the higher bands, because you get sporadic E on the lower bands as well. So you may find that um, a lot of your contacts on even 20 meters or even 40 meters are via sporadic E in the summer. And this will show you, hopefully, um, where the best uh, places to work uh, are on sporadic E. But that's PropQuest anyway. Now, in terms of sporadic E, we just talked about that. This is some research I did in 2014, trying to see um, whether you could correlate sporadic E with meteor showers. And the answer really was, looking at this chart, is uh, no, you couldn't. Um, this was some... RBN spots that I was logging um, from ER16 and DK8NE, and we plotted it. So you can see that the sporadic E season starts around about here, which is the 14th of May, I think it is. Then we got the May peak, then it died down a bit, then we had a bit more of a peak as again, and then it kind of tails off until, well, end of August or so, you find it di dies off you'll see that these peaks don't really correspond to these uh, meteor showers that we had at these particular times. And there is now a theory that um, it isn't the meteor showers that cause um, you know, the sporadic E peaks, but just a random meteor input um, um, from the, from, well, from, from meteors. And combine that with um, jet streams and um, winds that are uh, 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 odds with each other, pushing each other to, to move these, this, this, these um, sporadic E uh, particles into place um, that, that causes it. So this is ongoing research, really. But it, it's beginning to show that um, we know that, that sporadic E is multifactorial, absolutely. Um, but we think it's more to do with um, random meteor input. And we also think that it's more to do with um, jet streams and wind shear in the upper atmosphere that moves these two things, uh, particles, in uh, different directions and compresses them into these short, small layers. Um, but that's sporadic E anyway. So lots of work going on there. And I know Jim is very, very keen to um, get the uh, sporadic E um, EPI up and running. And it's up and running now, but he wants to get it just enhanced a little bit. And uh, that will be ready and up and running for uh, May the 1st or thereabouts for the sporadic E season. So what tools are available now? Well, if you'd have done this talk 10 years ago, we'd have been talked about SSB, we talked about CW, uh, RITI, maybe PSK. But now look at how we have now got modes that will go well below the noise level. Um, you know, FT4, FT8, JT65 and Whisper 
whisper being the most sensitive, can take things right the way down into the noise. Um, and this is really highlighting a, a few um, things that we never really saw before. There is, in fact, sporadic E all year round. Um, we just never really knew about it. Um, and we're finding now that you're, we're getting uh, FT8 um, signals appearing on the bands all sorts of times. Um, I did, there's something in Radcom this month, actually, that I've written on people who are hearing FT8 signals on 10 meters from the continent, from uh, Holland and thereabouts. And uh, it's a mixture of things. We think a lot of it is ground wave. We think a lot of it is, is scatter, iron scatter and um, tropo scatter as well. But it's really opened up a whole new area for research that we didn't realize these, that it was actually these signals were, were capable of being propagated. Um, so yes, it's, it's, it's all good stuff. So if you've not been on um, the bands recently, do have a listen because you'd be very surprised at the sort of stuff you can hear. And just to give you an idea, this was the Newark Hamfest, uh, not in 2020 because there wasn't one. This is 2019, and um, basically we talked about whether we should have a whisper demonstration on the site. And I said, well, not really. I said it's it's pretty pointless. The Newark Hamfest is basically a um, you know it, it's a, it's a Faraday cage, um, but uh, anyway. One of our members decided that, no, let's give it a whirl. So he had a, uh, I think it was 10 watts, and this tiny, tiny sort of three-foot antenna. We, we, we basically put it onto the, uh, the board there with the, the clamp and uh, set it running to see what could happen. And, uh, well, I had to eat my words, really, because this, this shows you how far, where we were picked up. So this was, I think it was five, five or 10 watts of uh, whisper from a three-foot antenna from inside the Newark Hamfest, where if anyone's ever been there, it's basically a big metal, you know, uh, place, shed. Um, so, you know, you shouldn't be able to uh, hear anything at all, I wouldn't have thought. But we were picked up right as far as way, uh, as far away as, um, um, what's that, that'd be Florida, wouldn't it? Um, and up as far as Iceland and down as far as uh, EA8. So um, just goes to show you what you can do with Whisper anyway. Well, what other tools are available then? So, other tools you can use? Well, obviously, the cluster is very useful uh, for spotting things. Um, and the reverse beacon network, very, very useful for working out paths to places. You know, if you can put out a signal on the reverse beacon network, put out a CQ on CW or, or test D, and then your call sign, it will show you where you've been picked up all over the place. You'd be surprised. So, even if nobody comes back to you, which is very common nowadays, unfortunately. This will show you where you're being picked up. So it's both useful tools, um, cluster probably uh, less so, but the reverse beacon work, the reverse beacon network, absolutely useful tool for working out where you can get to. A um, little bit like Whisper as well, but um, you can do it very, very quickly. And a quick tip on this one is if you, if you send out a signal, maybe you're comparing antennas, you send out a signal with this, just move your, your VFO, maybe two or three KCs, and send out another CQ, and it will log you. Because it's designed to uh, basically ignore signals that it hears from one station on the same frequency. So if you put out a call, um, you've got to change frequency, just QSY very slightly to be, you know, to be picked up again. But it's no problem at all to do that. Just, just, just quickly just change the frequency and uh, then you'll be picked up again. And you can, you can compare the signal strength. So it's a great way of comparing antennas um, as well. A club log, fantastic um, tool, absolutely. So instead of calculating the best times to work areas, club log actually has a massive log um, of signals or, or contacts that have been made on what band and when. So, for instance, if you're trying to work uh, Alaska, UK to Alaska, as I was in October, Club Log will show you exactly where you need to be at that time. So you can see up here that, uh, you know, on so 17 meters, six o'clock, I think, or 1736, uh, 1800 was, was the, the optimum time. Although there are only two Q QSOs made with that. Uh, what's that, 30 meters there, another one there, 17, uh, 1900, beg your pardon, 7 p.m. Another good one to try there, or 40 meters 
again, 7 p.m., 30 QSOs made for there. So it shows you, if you're trying to work a particular place, this is a great tool for working out who's actually worked that station or that, that entity or that square or that uh, you know, call sign area. Um, and, uh, you know, when did they actually do it? So it's, it's a great tool for propagation predictions without actually doing any predicting, if you like. Okay, PSK Report, another fantastic tool that's available. Um, this will log FT8 signals, CW signals. Um, it will do RITI as well, I think, and PSK. So basically, you pick a band and you say, okay, um, what stations has my station? Say I've been running FT8. What has my station heard over the last 24 hours or six hours, three hours, 30 minutes, whatever? and you put your call sign in and run it and there you go and i've been using this recently to try and work north dakota i need north dakota for my work to all states and so by using this you can actually see when your signal or your station is picking up signals from north dakota and that will tell you the best times to to, to work it as well um I'll, I'll, I'll warn you though there's only about five or six stations in north dakota that are active so it, it, it's quite a tricky one and propagation in March is not so good to North Dakota. We've missed we've missed the, uh, the the good propagation. Should have been doing it in December, January. But it's another great tool. But if you're not using it, give it a whirl and see what you think of it. And it's uh, fantastic. Okay, so let's get on to the Propagation Studies Committee's work on uh, online tools. Now, this all really stems from. Gwyn Williams charts that I've been in Radcom for oh, 20 odd years, I think, maybe more. Um, these uh, charts appear every month and it'll, it's got 26 locations around the world. And you have a, uh, a probability of being able to uh, work these places from the UK. Now, the trouble is that we're trying to come up with charts here that are trying to be everything to everyone. Now, if you are um, an M6 or whatever, it's an M7 now, I think, running 10 watts to a, a compromise antenna uh, on sideband, you are going to get a totally different um, opinion of the state of the bands compared with somebody running, say, 400 watts to a three-element step or 100 feet. Um, and we, get, we often hear lots and lots of complaints or comments that, well, I can do far, far better than these charts say I can. And other people said, well, it says here I should be able to work South America, and I, or, and I, haven't, I haven't heard them. So this was a, a dilemma that's been on the go for some time. Um, first thing to say is these are median charts. These are the average, if you like, or median um, propagation figures for working particular paths. Now, that means that yesterday it may not have been as good as this. Today it might be better, and tomorrow it may be worse. Um, you can never say that the, this is for every day of the month. So this is a median uh, propagation prediction um, for uh, paths to these particular um, areas of the world. Um, anyway, we talked about this on and on, and I, you know, I was very aware that uh, this was an issue, and we were trying to think of how we could improve the charts, especially now FT8 has come along. So we talked about it, and uh, Peter, one of our members, said, well, how about putting uh, one to nine in terms of signal strength, and then we have letters uh, I think it's about A to F, um, for signals below the noise. So we, we've introduced that recently um, to show the, that, that figures below the noise um, can, can be detected from some of these places and the likelihood of that happening. But these are based on 100 watts to a dipole. Um, that is the, um, the information that's put into the charts. So as I said, there'll never be everything to everyone. So we needed a way of actually making this more usable um, for the rest of the world. And we came up with this. The, this was the first um, thing we started with. So this is online. It's vocap.com slash radcom. Um, Yari OH6BG is one of the main programmers behind Vocap. And I said to Yari, well, okay, can we do this um, online? Could it, would it be possible to do this? I said, so he said, well, what do you want? I said, well, we need to say where your, your grid locator is because the RADCOM um, predictions are based from the center of the UK. But can we be a bit more specific? So, yes, we want to say that. We want to say how much power we're running. Yeah, okay. And we want to run uh, 
what mode are we running? Because you'll, you'll get a better result with CW or FT8 than you will SSB. And then we need to be able to change the gain of the antennas as well that are being used. So we came up with this idea. And so you can dial up, you want CW, you're running 100 watts, you've got a tri-band or a dipole, uh, whatever feet, um, and you put your grid locator in and you hit run. Um, so I said to Yari, this is what the sort of thing I want. He said, well, leave it with me, I'll see what I can do. And lo and behold, he, I kid you not, in 24 hours he came back and he, he came up with what is effectively being used now. So now you can put your details into this. And I really encourage everybody who's interested in propagation to do this um, because you're now going to get um, tailored propagation prediction for your particular station. So when we hit the uh, run button, now we get a chart like this. So we've got the same uh, locations as in the RADCOM um, predictions. And then we get a, a color code. Um, so this shows you to Moscow, for example, the warmer it is, you know, this, this is the scale, so 0% to 100% chance, you can see there uh, uh, 20 meters, you know, that, that's pretty warm. That's probably the best band to work for Moscow during the day. And at night time, you can see we've got 18, 40 meters uh, as well. Now, the thing is, it can do, whoops, sorry, beg your pardon. It can do hour by hour reliability predictions for each band. Some of the locations we've done short path and long path. Uh, places like New Zealand and I think it's uh, Los Angeles or San Francisco, San Francisco, that's right. Uh, four of them are, are short path and long path. So you can run this and it only takes about, uh, you know, two minutes to run it. Um, it will give you a, a nice set of charts. You can print them out, put them on the wall and you've got your own propagation predictions, which are tailored to your station. So again, if you are... Um, you know, a more experienced ham with a, a great station, with great antennas, and you're running 400 watts or so, um, you, you'll probably get a better result from these as well. It also shows you the sunrise and sunset time, so you can uh, pick mutual darkness if you are trying to work low bands as well. So that's a, that's a great tool. So that's the first tool that we came up with, which is uh, the VOACAP RADCOM tool. And we'll sh I'll show the URL for that again at the end of the, uh, the, the presentation. But I think this is a, um, a great tool. This is, we can never ever do this with RADCOM. That's the trouble. You know, we don't have the room and we don't have the ability to, um, to change things like this. So I really want to encourage everybody to use this tool um, to augment what we've done with RADCOM really um, to help us you know, with, with, with your propagation predictions. And this, again, is produced um, by VOACAP, which has uh, been in, in, in existence for some time now and was produced for Voice of America. It's pretty accurate, actually. It's uh, very good. Um, but again, these are median um, predictions. So some days will be better, some days will be worse. And they don't take into account the KP index as well. So um, again, probably uh, someone said today, actually, that... Um, Predictions are okay as long as they don't involve the future. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry. He did say that. Yeah. Um, right. No. Okay. There is another program that's been around now for a couple of years called ITURHF Prop. So I know it's a mouthful, but there we go. Um, this has been produced by the ITU, and it was previously known as REC 533, I think it was. Recommendation 533, but it was released as a PC-based program um, a few years back now, about three years ago, four years ago maybe. And he said, wouldn't it be nice if we could take the program, which has a, it, it's quite a text-based input. You have an input file, you run it, and then you have some text output. Wouldn't it be great if we could then use that to produce um, the sort of maps we're used to seeing on VOACAP um, as well? So... This was originally produced by Gwyn Williams um, and uh, was uh, produced by Gwyn with help from a programmer called James Watson, 8Z1JW, uh, fantastic guy. And so we said to James, look, we've just done this with VOACAP. Uh, now, ITURHF prop is supposed to be a more accurate program. Uh, I'm not going to get into whether it is or it isn't, but there have been tests done uh, that prove that it is more accurate. But so what we want to do again is put your date in, your power, your mode, uh, your noise level, uh, locator, and what antennas uh, you're using either end. 
and you know, can we can we come up with these charts but use ITURHF prop rather than VOACAP? So again, uh, James did a great job on this one, and we we call it Proppy. We well, call it Proppy actually. Um, and again, it, it comes up with charts like this. So you've got the likelihood or the probability, circuit, circuit reliability, basic circuit reliability is the technical term for it, uh, which the hotter it is, the more likely you are to make the, uh, the, the, the trip. And then it's got a figure in there, which is the S meter reading as well. So again, this is just basically repeating what we've done with VOACAP, but with a different ionospheric model. Um, so again, you can produce a list of charts like this and print them off and put them on your wall for the month. Uh, so again, it works in a very, very similar way. Um, but again, more accurate for you. And uh, hopefully uh, you can tailor it to your particular uh, mode that you like, whether you're an FT8 fanatic or CW fanatic or SSB fanatic, and whether you're running power or not. Um, because it's, you know, propagation is, is not just about propagation, it's what you're doing with it. And, and as anyone who's ever played with Whisper will find, you know, you can get a one watt Whisper signal around the world, but a one watt SSB signal uh, may not be so uh, so lucky. So there we go. Um, so just going back to uh, VoaCat online, um, we use these programs to produce these results, but the programs are now there. Um, in their own right. So VOACAP, which is, well, was and it still is a PC-based program, is now available on the web as well, at VOACAP Online. So if you put VOACAP.com, you can go to VOACAP Online and, uh, and play with it. And th this is a fantastic program um, that's been produced by Yari, James, and you, you hope. Um, now, what I would say about this is, it can look quite complicated and it's worthwhile spending a bit of time with it to see what you can do with it. Um, for instance, in this one, on a point to point basis, you put up a, 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 a where you are, put the, you know, drop the, uh, the, the marker of where you are, you put where you're trying to work, and uh, then there's a number of ways of doing it. This is the, the rosette method of showing you the best band um, for that particular path at that particular time. So you can see for this one that uh, this was, I think, Norwich to, to New York. And it shows me that, mm, I don't know, what's that? It's about 17 meters is probably best there in the afternoons, coming in at about one and going off about six. And so you can, you can actually start to produce um, charts like this for your own paths, for your own contacts that you wish to make. Um, and it works very, very well. But look along the bottom. You see all those, those green boxes there? I'm not going to go through all of them, but if you press the um, REL uh, SDBW SNR box, it will come up with a graph um, of that information rather than the rosette. Um, but you've got a gray line, you've got uh, ooh, distance planners, planners for DX as well. It's a fantastic uh, website and all completely free. So I thoroughly um, advise you really to, to go and play with it and get used to it and, and find out how to work. It will also do area uh, plots as well, uh, not just point to point plots. So again, very useful tool as well. But it does take some time to get to know and to get, get used to. Um, so again, do go and have a play with it and uh, find out what works for you and what, what you like and what you don't like about it as well. Or you can, plot, you know, can print all these plots off immediately as well. You, know, you can save them as files or print them. So again, it, it, does, it means that you don't need to have a PC running all the time doing propagation prediction stuff. Um, it will run on any machine connected to the internet. So you start doing it on your iPads and your Android tablets and your Chromebooks, uh, which we can never do five, seven years ago. So that's fantastic. This is a VOA cap plot from Norwich to New York that I ran. Um, it will also do a best plot uh, or every month. So you can quickly look at this and look where you're going to get 90% and here. So January uh, was a good month. There we are. I think you, you can actually say what band you're actually working on. So I can't remember what band this was. And it might have been, uh, might have been uh, well, it's the, it's the best band for that time. So you need to run another chart to see it. So on the left-hand side here, we've got the uh, basic circuit reliability map, which shows you for Norwich to New York, um, I think this was February, wasn't it? 
guess it was, this was February. Um, you can see that 21 megs just comes in, just just touching on, on 21 megs, but 14 meg, 18 megs and 14 megs are better, probably between those, those times of 12 till 6 or thereabouts. Um, but if you want to know the best month and time to work New York, look for where these uh, are going red. And you'll see that uh, January, it was that December and January were probably the best months at those times. And I'm guessing, I need to check, but I'm guessing that that's probably 80 meters or 40 meters at night there. But it also shows you that in June and July, uh, we have a big hole there. It's, you know, because the way the ionosphere reacts in the summer, People think, well, the ionosphere needs sunlight, obviously, to uh, be um, ionized. But the ionosphere changes its composition in the summer. It changes from a monatomic makeup to diatomic makeup in the summer. And these diatomic molecules are a lot harder to ionize, the more strongly bound together. So this is why in the summer, on the whole, HF propagation is not very good at all. Okay, we get sporadic E, you know, from May to uh, August, you get sporadic E, brilliant. But long um, distance F2 layer stuff in the summer, not quite so good. So what we trade off in the summer is, okay, we've got sporadic E to play with and the bands stay open longer, even maybe 24 hours on 20 meters in June. But propagation on the whole is not so good. Uh, October, November, uh, early December are better months for propagation. So uh, it's just a fact of life, I'm afraid. You have to get used to it. But again, these are all produced by VOACAP, so go and have a play with it and see what you think. This is a VOACAP um, for uh, a plot for, uh, what is it? Oh, it's the area prop, plot, plot, beg your pardon, for one o'clock on a February day, a smooth sunspot number of 17. We always use the smooth sunspot number, an average sunspot number, uh, which works better. So this is 20 meters, uh, 80 watts CW. And there you see the antennas we've set up. I think that's dipoles, dipoles. Yep, there we go. And so from the UK, you can see that we, these are the areas that you're likely to work. So we've got a, um, a nice plot there, a nice warm spot across the Caribbean and also the east coast of the US. Um, but it's obviously not a good time at all to work uh, Australia, a uh, short path anyway. So again, you can, you can do anything you want nowadays. You can you know, run it whichever way you want, and VOCAP will give, produce charts like this. Okay. Now, um, I said earlier that uh, ITURHF IT, prop uh, came about three years ago, and Gwyn, worked we we had the idea we wanted an online program like vocap that will do it and he came up with pred test and this is an awful lot of work that went into this to produce the kind of charts that we were used to seeing on vocap we can now do it with iturhf prop as well and again this is um, a coverage map from the uk for 20 meters at midday in october 100 watts per dipole, and again, so you can see the kind of areas that you're likely to work. So that first skip zone there puts us into Spain or thereabouts, and second skip zone puts us uh, further into North Africa and whatever. But you can see that there, that's uh, October. There's nothing really down to South America or across into um, North America at all. So again, if you want to work particular parts of the world, Pick, pick your time, pick your band, absolutely. Um, so PredTest was produced by Gwyn. And again, you can use it. It's free to use, doesn't cost anything. RSGB sponsors it. And it was produced by uh, James, again, James Watson, H HZ1JW, who despite the Saudi Arabian call sign is actually a Brit, but he's an expat, he works out there. And I think this is a fantastic tool as well. So let's give you an example of how you could use um, PredTest. So this is South Dakota, which is one of the states I need. I need three states to get my work to all states. Um, and I didn't realize when I first started this, but I think the, the <laughs> radio hands, I think I've counted about six in South Dakota and about four in Wyoming, so there we go. Um, but let's just show you how you can use it. So we want to get a good, good plot and time 
people working uh, South Dakota from the UK. So again, we're using PredTest. So we put our uh, marker on the UK there. Uh, we put our marker on South Dakota. I put it in the middle of the state there. And then we run the program. So this is what I came up with. Um, so again, it shows you 20 meters between about two o'clock and four o'clock with a little peak there, not very long peak, but maybe an hour's best time. And this is a dipole to dipole. Um, with a smooth sunspot number 14. Again, we need more sunspots, to be honest. But this is, this is the way you use PredTest to do point-to-point -point, uh, calculations. So basically, this was saying to me, you want to work North Dakota, you're wasting your time anywhere else, uh, unless you want to come down to 5 megs, 3.5 megs or thereabouts, maybe even 7 megs just on sunrise. It's going to be that time there. Um, now, I cheated a little bit. So instead of running dipole to dipole, I said, OK, what about tri-bander to tri-bander? Um, and we'll up the power a little bit as well. And it came up with this chart. So this just gives a bit more detail, really. Um, again, you know, that 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock time there. Excuse me. And the basic circuit reliability said it would be about 60%, 70%. Um, so it's, it's a quick and easy way of coming up with the best and optimum times to work um, particular places in the, well, anywhere in the world, actually. And uh, you'd be probably annoyed to, or pleased to know that I haven't worked uh, North, uh, South Dakota yet at all. Um, the conditions have been so bad that uh, we've, we've had a couple of scares and we've, we've heard each other, but not enough to really make the contact on, on CW anyway. We're, we're, we're going to have to wait, I think, until the, uh, the autumn comes um, we, and a few more sunspots as well. But it's a, it's a great tool for uh, plotting. You know, if you need to work a particular place, or as a de expedition, the expedition on, then you can work out the best times to work on what bands as well. Um, almost to the end now. But um, what I would say is, if you're interested in gray line propagation, um, you need to know where's the sun rising, where's the sun setting. Here's a free program that you can download there. It's called mapmaker.com or sunclock from mapmaker.com. And it's a free program. Um, you can pay the money and they'll take their logo off it, but you don't have to. You can just run it. It's a PC-based program. Um, and you can, you can tailor it how you want. So you can have uh, areas around the world highlighted and you can have the, the local time there as well. You can see this Terminator as it comes across the, 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 the world. So if you want to work uh, along the gray line, it will show you where the gray line is. And this, this gray line is going to end actually vertical in about three weeks' time. Um, so you know, not so much use for working gray line to other parts of the, of the world. But it's a useful tool, um, especially when we get a few more sunspots. For example, I found on 10 meters um, signals that were crossing the Terminator at right angles uh, just after sunset, you find that usually on 10 meters that the signal boosted. It went up a couple of uh, S points, not for long, maybe about 10 minutes. Um, it's a, you know, caused by the sun setting. But it's, we think what happens is that the, the, um, the rays go very high angle at that point, And you get what is known as a Peterson ray, um, which uh, propagates quite easily. So it's a good way of working out uh, the, you know, the best times and places to work parts of the world. Um, and this is an example, 3Y0X, Peter the First Island, did some propagation work on that. And basically, this shows you the best time to work 3Y0X. And this green blob here is the best time to work on 80 meters. Um, and we found that people were working from the UK just on sunrise. Can you see that? In fact, I had to do two. I had to calculate it for Norwich and calculate it for Eastleigh um, as well, because some of the uh, people were, were further west than me. So you can see that these people were working at the first island, which is in the Antarctica, just on sunrise. And this just shows the importance of knowing um, you know, when is the sun rising, uh, so you can work stuff on the low bands. Now, this, this kind of period of time on, on top band this this kind of um, enhancement if you like can only maybe only last about a minute or so on 80 meter it's wider and they, on 40 meters it's wider still but it's a it's a good 
good tool to have to know where is the sun rising and uh, what's it actually doing so you can plan um, the best times to do various propagation to, um, uh, paths. And this, as I said, Peter the First on 3Y0X, uh, who I didn't work, um, but uh, plenty of people did. And as you said, that shows you at sun, sunrise um, on this path, part of the path was the time, best time to get in there. Good. So almost finally there now, but why is HF propagation so complex? Well, I, I borrowed this chart from uh, an American ham because it just, it's got everything in it. So it's got equatorial anomalies. We've got plumes, ionospheric crests, ionospheric troughs, uh, you know, uh, energetic particles coming in, we've got solar wind coming in, uh, enhanced extreme ultraviolet. Uh, it just shows you there is so many elements to ionospheric propagation that you can't just say, well, yes, it's, uh, you know, it's going to happen. It's going to be okay today because every day is different. Um, it may be that there are more sunspots on a particular day, but the solar wind, as we found earlier from the um, coronal holes, may be increasing. Now, that may give us an initial enhancement, but then it's probably going to um, close the, the bands down and lower the maximum usable frequencies. So you need to consider um, what band you want to be on, what time of year is it, what time of day is it, um, and all these, all these characteristics here. So... I think it's what amazes me about ionospheric propagation uh, or HF propagation. There are, there are so many factors that we still don't fully understand uh, come into effect. Um, but uh, that's what makes it an, an interesting hobby anyway. So there we go. These are the URLs for the tools that I've talked about today. So we've got PropQuest, which is the FOF2 critical frequency tool from Jim Bacon, G3YLA. PredTest, um, which is the ITR HF prop to power predictions. Proppy, uh, VOACAP power predictions. And I also put a, a link up there for my uh, hourly VOACAP predictions. Um, what I did is I used VOACAP to produce monthly, hourly, um, charts for every band. So there's 192 charts per month, and I've got a year's worth which I've produced. So rsgb.org slash g0kya will take you there. In fact, all of these have got shortcuts from rsgb. Um, so we've got rsgb.org, propquest, predtest, proppy, boacap, and g0kya, and it will take you there. And as I said, the g0kya is a very, very quick and easy, just select the, um, the, the hour you want and the month you want, and you can quickly just click through it and just see how propagation changes as the day goes on. But um, you know, feel free to use any of these tools. Uh, they're produced for you. They're completely free to use. And hopefully um, it will uh, help you, you know, plan your HF operation uh, better. And I, I do hope we do get some more sunspots because that will definitely help an awful lot. So at that point, David, I think we have to open up to any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. I'll let you, you you've talked continuously for about... I don't know, uh, 75 minutes, I think, without a break. So I'm now going to let you have a drink of water. Sorry. I see you're just, no, no, you, you, you've absolutely deserved that. Thank you very much for everything. Uh, we've got a few questions for you as well, but if you have been waiting to ask a question, this will be the good time to do it. Uh, use either the YouTube chat or the uh, BATC messaging to enter a question for Steve now. Uh, but let's have a, a question first for Steve. I think the first one that came up was from uh, Tristan, uh, G0KAY. He says, Steve, you do so much work into propagation. How did you start getting into it? And is it your profession? Uh, no, it's not my profession at all, actually. Um, I'm a technologist, but I work in uh, aviation uh, rather than uh, propagation. Um, I, how did I get started? I, I, well, it's a good question. When I was first licensed, uh, I was kind of intrigued by what, what drives all this, because it is so much to take in. And there weren't really that many books around either. So I think, you, you, I think you, like everything, you start with, well, why does, why does the bands do that? And why do they shut at night? And, uh, you know, why is uh, June not a good month to work the States, but October is? And I think it was just a, a, a being, you know, just asking questions like that. And uh, it kind of developed. I did some research on gray line propagation back in uh, early 2000, um, which is still as valid today as it ever was. So you just, just built it up. Then I joined the Propagation Studies Committee and uh, started to go to their uh, you know, biannual meetings. 
and uh, just just went from there really. But I think the last three years, probably three years, there's just been this enormous growth in online software um, that's built up out of VOACAP and ITURHF prop, which means it's so much easier to just just play with it and do you know what if questions. So if, for instance, you 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 know you need Peru or wherever for your DXCC. Well, now you can work out exactly the best time to do it or the, the most likely time to be able to do it. So, no, I don't work at it professionally, although I, my work takes me to the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not really meant to be there for the HF side of things. Um, but, no, it, it was just a, just an interest, really, that, that kind of grew and grew. Mm, OK. Uh, Steve M0MOI says, PSK Reporter does free DV too. With the latest software. That's what. Sorry, three DV two. Um, he says um, PSK Reporter does free DV F R A E D V two with the latest software. I'm not sure what that means. I hoped you would. Nope. Oh. <laughs> I'm not familiar with that one. I'm afraid. All right. So, well, Steve, thanks for um, your feedback. Maybe you'd just like to put a note in there yeah. um, very shortly um, with what you mean by uh, free DV, and we'll, we'll certainly carry that back to Steve. Lots of compliments, of course, Steve. Uh, lots of people very interested in this subject. I think we all realise how important it is uh, for our hobby, even though it does seem a very complex subject indeed. Um, uh, what, do you have a particular favourite propagation tool yourself? If you're about to go on the radio and you haven't got time to look at all of these, which one would you go to? Um, I think I'd probably go to... Um Oh, what would it be? Uh, probably PredTest because we, you know, RSGB supports PredTest. It actually pays for the hosting fees. And I, I just know how much work uh, um, Gwyn has put into it. And, you know, it will just show you at that particular hour of the day. The, the thing is with amateur radio is you tend to, have to actually have to operate when you've, um, you know, when you've got time. So a quick look at that will show you roughly where... Um, you should be able to work the areas that you can work and um you know so probably pred test would be a good starting point I think. That, that just to remind us that was the one with the locator at the top wasn't it and then you put in which band you wanted to work and press run is, is that right um yeah well pred test um actually well no no not really pred test is is the the tool that does point to point calculations and will do area calculations um and but it's driven by iturhf prop um, but Proppy uh, is the tool that does the um, RSGB RADCOM locations. So again, yes, I suppose you, you could say that as well. So either Proppy or VOACAP, um, either rsgb.org slash Proppy or rsgb.org slash VOACAP, that's where you can put in your location, um, how much power you're running, etc., etc., antennas. And it will give you a bunch of charts that you, it will show you all the major locations around the world. Okay, thanks. So, yeah. Thank you, Steve, for elaborating that. Uh, Steve has come back, actually, just confusing me on the other platform on BATC, and says, free DV equals 700 hertz voice. David, and that's David, uh, David, and then Dadash saying David Rowe. So I don't know if that means any more to you. Uh, Free DV, yeah, right. This is a digital voice tool, isn't it? It's a little bit like um, DMR, but for HF. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with it, but if you can do propagation predictions with it, or, or it will actually show you what you can do with it, that's good. I think PSK Reporters is a fantastic tool um, because it will it'll allow you to run a number of different modes. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's superb. Yeah, I've used it for CW. I've used it for uh, FT8. You can do FT4 as well. So it's a, it's a good way of seeing who's on where in the world because, you know, I can run it and say, put my course on, who's, who, who, who am I picking up? And it will, it will show me on the world where I can actually, uh, where I'm picking station signals up. Or you can say, well, okay, who's picking, who's anyone picking these people up? And so it will just come up with a list of all the stations on the, on the map of the world that are actually active at that time. So you can see the ones you're not hearing, which is in, as important as the ones mm. you can hear. And the ones you can um, go after. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it's quite useful. And it, that's why I've built up a little database of stations in South Dakota. So I, 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 you know, I've got them now. Um, so you can actually then load that into JTDX. I think it's JTDX. Um, so it, it knows what it's looking for. 
Uh, yeah, the radio has changed so much, hasn't it? Well, it, it has, and I mean, the technology that's available to us now, and I guess the internet is the core of that because it allows us oh, to look yes. at things that we could never have done 20 years ago. Yeah, uh, We've got South, South yeah. Dublin Radio Club has said, can you recommend a go-to source regarding understanding K indices, etc.? Ooh, right. Um, let's have a thing. If you go to my blog spot, blog spot um, page, so it's g0kya.blogspot.com or .co.uk, I think, um, you'll see that you can download a free PDF booklet on there called Understanding HF Propagation. And I think um, a lot of this stuff is in that. And basically, I wrote it about 10 years ago with Alan Melia. Um, and I think we explain a lot of that stuff there. And it's free to download. And it, it will tell you what the K-index is. Basically, the, the K-index is a measure of how disturbed the Earth's magnetic field is. Um, if you can imagine the Earth's magnetic field, uh, nice, and, nice and settled. And then it gets bombarded with these, uh, this high-speed uh, solar wind, which is basically um, ions, it distorts the magnetic field. And this can be detected with magnetometers on the Earth. And it's a case of how much is this being distorted uh, as to um, how high the K-index goes. So we talk about the A-index and the K-index. Well, I prefer the K-index. The A-index is a, um, a linear measure, and it's updated every uh, 24 hours, I think. K-index is logarithmic. Um, so it goes kind of one to nine, or you hopefully you never see a K of nine. But it's updated every three hours. So it's quite possible to have a geomagnetic storm in progress, but it's not reflected in the K indices um, because the K index is only updated every um, three hours. So the way I work on it is I, I go to solarham.com um, and you can, there's a little chart there, or a little measure then from um, the, no, which one is it? I can't remember which spacecraft it is, whether it's SDO. Um, no, it's not, is it? It's, it's one of the spacecraft there, and it shows you, oh, it's the ACE spacecraft, that's right. And it shows you the solar wind speed and the direction of its frozen in magnetic field. So if you see that um, solar wind speed going up, and you see the BZ pointing south and the density in, increasing, then basically it says, yep, we've got problems coming on here. Um, and it will, you, will, you will know before anyone else, because it will then probably take maybe two or three hours for the K-index to change. But that, that's basically what, what it is. So, yeah, hmm. I agree. It's complex, isn't it? <laughs> well, it, it is. It was your showing. Um, indeed. And as you were talking about other things that people can go and look at and refer to after this webinar, um, we, we must refer all people also to your great book, Radio Propagation Explained, which you wrote a few years ago. And it's available now from the RSGB bookshop at rsgb.org forward slash shop. And I, in fact, I looked earlier today and it's on special offer at the moment. So Ooh, if you want to right. do some more reading up, that would be a good place to go as well. Got some more questions for you here, Steve. Um, uh, where are we? Oh, they've just whizzed by me. By the way, uh, Ian uh, GM4 VXM says, Thank this has been fascinating, Steve. Thanks so much for showing and outlining how each tool can be used. This will be very useful. Um, and the next question, I've noticed that this is from uh, John M7CPT. Um, I've noticed that shortly after the evening grey line, I experienced a dead spot for about 10 to 20 minutes. Do you know what could be causing this? Um, it depends which band he's talking about. Um, what we what you generally find is that, well, when the sun sets, basically we have an F2 layer. Um, and that F1 layer and F2 layer, and they will combine after sunset to form just an, um, one single layer. So when the sun sets, there's an awful lot going on in the ionosphere, and it takes a while for it to settle. Um, sometimes we find that the, the critical frequency drops and then rises again shortly after. Um, so, yeah, I'm not surprised that it's, uh, it's a period of change, basically, and uh, all sorts of things can happen. We, we find that... Um, Sometimes you get high angle signals coming in. As the sun sets, you, some stations from further afield get a little bit louder, and then they, they drop out again. And I think that's because, as I said, the uh, changes from um, a low angle radiation to a high angle. Um, so the, the ionosphere favors high angle signals. 
there's an awful lot going on as well. But yeah, um, I'd, I'd need to know which band particularly he's, he's talking about when he says it, it, it fades out and it gets better again. But that doesn't, doesn't surprise me at all. OK, John, well, if you're watching now, still watching, and you can very quickly put on what band, we'll quickly ask Steve that. Um, a few other questions and comments for you, Steve. Uh, Graham G8NWC says, as someone who enjoys QRP, everything to help is always an advantage. So thanks for another great presentation. And uh, Alfonso writes and says, greetings from TI3ATS. Right. Um, Is that Costa Rica, I think? I, I was hoping you'd know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd have to look it up. I think, I think it is. Yeah. If I'm wrong, I apologise. But uh, yeah, somewhere I don't get to talk to very often. I must no, be. no, absolutely. Well, I haven't got anything else um, back from John, but um, I'm sure he can ask you the questions anyway, because you did put that link on your, sh on your yeah. slide. And in fact, a lot of that will be putting on the webinar when it's recorded and available in a couple of days time okay. on the YouTube channel. So we'll be putting those as well. Um, have we got another? Oh yes, we have got amateur radio on the air. Uh, sorry, this is John M7 CPT says 30 meters and 15 meters. They're the bands okay. that he sees this gray line. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, say 15 meters? 30 and 15 is what is put. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, 15 would be a classic because it, it, 15 is a band where as the sun sets, probably 15 meters closes quite quickly. Um, so that would, ex that would explain a lot. And it's unlikely to recover either. Um, that, makes, that makes sense. 30 meters is an odd band. It's, it's kind of a, an in-between band, but um, it has some characteristics of a daylight band and some characteristics of a nighttime band. But again, it's, if you look at the critical frequency um, as the sun sets, it, it drops uh, quite quickly. So I wouldn't be surprised to find that the, you know, the bands close. Um, that doesn't surprise me. But then sometimes you see it will flick up a little bit again and, and improve. That, that, that is quite common. So it, it is a time of change, great change in the ionosphere, absolutely. So yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me at all. I guess it's what, one, of, one of the things that makes our hobby so interesting and fascinating yeah. And, yeah. and challenging as well at times. Oh, uh, yeah. I think we're really pretty much there now, Steve. Just one thing, I'd, I'd like to do a special mention here to Kevin Duffy from St Shropshire. He didn't give a call sign because he hasn't got a call sign yet, but he put in that he joined the RSGB today and that he's looking hey. forward to getting his license uh, so welcome to the RSGB and to the hobby, to uh, Kevin, yes. and we hope you, you'll find everything that you need to know, I'm sure, either on the RSGB website or lots of other things online as well. Do an online course maybe and, and do your exam, so welcome to the hobby. But uh, that about concludes this evening's webinar, so thanks very much again to you, Steve, g 0 ky thanks very much. Thank you very much. And uh, we hope that you at home have as enjoyed this tonight at 8 and that you'll join us again next time where we'll be getting an introduction to vector network analyzers and in particular the Nano VNA. If you'd like to see details of that and other webinars or to send any comments or feedback, please visit www.rsgb.org forward slash webinars. And remember, if you subscribe to the RSGB's YouTube channel, you'll be notified of all upcoming tonight at 8 webinars, as well as other new videos and presentations from the Society on a wide range of amateur radio topics. But until next time, this is David G7URP signing off and clear. Bye-bye.